Welcome to In the Green Chair, an interview podcast series for people looking to begin or expand their career in the green economy. I'm your host, Anna Garza, and today's guest in the green chair is staff lawyer for West Coast Environmental Law, Eugene Kung. And for me, the way that we get out of this climate crisis that we're in is to incorporate better decision making. So for example, a shift, which is at the same time, uh, very subtle, but also arguably radical from our current decision making and our current legal structure. In this episode, we discuss Eugene's career journey and his work on opposing the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Expansion Project. We learn how collaborating with Indigenous communities is pivotal in revitalizing Canadian environmental law to be more inclusive and holistic. Welcome to the Green Chair, Eugene. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I know that you work for West Coast Environmental Law, which is a nonprofit group of environmental lawyers. Now, there are different fields and specializations in law, such as corporate, criminal, family law, etc. So why did you choose to become an environmental lawyer? You know, I will say just from the start that even though it was something that was in the back of my mind, it wasn't one of those situations where I like set a goal and then worked to achieve it. It was uh, as a mix of um, a little bit of luck, a little bit of opportunity and the ability to see that opportunity that uh, resulted in me ending up doing uh, this work. So in our pre-interview, when you and I met before, you mentioned that people interested in environmental law need to learn more about energy systems. Working at Relay Education, our key focus is increasing energy literacy, and we focus on teaching kids at, the, at a young age about our energy sources. Why do you believe that is important? The sources of energy that we have built our society around uh, primarily oil and gas, is at its heart uh, what, uh, what one um, uh, prominent scientist said was uh, the largest market failure in the history of society. And by that, what I mean is that, you know, the kind of extractive economy, the one that puts the price of a resource just on how much it costs to take it out of the earth, and process it and market it and sell it and so on uh, and with a profit doesn't actually capture the true cost to society uh, mm -hmm. that these things uh, cause. Um, and because of that, we have these artificially uh, cheap uh, or lower priced energy sources and particularly again, fossil fuels and oil and gas have been the primary, primary one. And then we built an entire society based on this premise that this energy was cheap and unlimited. And we're in a moment now, unfortunately, where the reality of that is catching up. And the good news is we have the technology to do it now. We can do it cheaper, but it's, it makes it harder to kind of shift those. And so I think understanding uh, the sources of energy and their impacts on 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 climate and their impacts on the natural world generally is really important for us all to 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 uh, to brush up on. Yeah, there are many externalities that aren't taken into account. So that that reminds me also of the other th second thing that you shared with me that people interested in environmental law should also unlearn. What did you mean by that? For me, it's been a, a part of a really important part of my journey, in particular uh, as it relates to working with and learning from Indigenous communities uh, who have lived uh, and uh, and stewarded uh, the lands that we now live on for thousands and thousands of years. And so there's a lot of uh, unlearning that comes along with that in terms of, for example, what are uh, you know, uh, sources of knowledge and information, what qualifies as, you know, expert uh, uh, information. And, you know, I'll, I'll always remember uh, something that one of the chiefs that I worked with uh, said was, you know, 10,000 years of observing natural uh, phenomenon is science, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of idea 
uh, that, uh, for example, indigenous traditional knowledge is somehow less than uh, uh, something that maybe comes out of a university uh, is a part of that unlearning, especially as a lawyer. Sometimes you're just asked to to provide advice and um, and sometimes the answers aren't in the law. Right. We have to remember yeah. that lo the law is also created by people, by humans who are fallible, who have egos, who um, w it, for whom it was impossible to predict the future that we are now living in. And I want to touch more about the Indigenous work that um, takes place at West Coast Environmental Law. So I know they there's an interesting program called RELAW, Re Revitalizing Indigenous Law for Land, Air and Water, where Indigenous nations who are part of RELAW have access to free legal services. Can you tell me more about this project and, and its importance? Sure. RELA is a really, really exciting and transformative uh, program, and it builds on decades of work, not only from uh, lawyers at West Coast, but in particular from Indigenous legal scholars, people like John Burroughs and Val Napoleon, who are now both at University of Victoria. Um, who have been moving and working really hard to uh, continue the revitalization of Indigenous laws uh, within uh, the territories where they existed. Think about uh, things like the, the potlatch ban, which was part of the Indian Act. Uh, these were deliberate and specific measures designed to break apart the social fabric of Indigenous communities, making it illegal to speak your language, making it illegal to, to gather and hold these ceremonies, which were really the place of sharing, learning, and deliberation. And at the end of the day, that's what law really is. You know, we think about maybe the criminal code or some bylaw or the Supreme Court of Canada or some legislation, mm -hmm. but that as law, but actually law is the act of a society gathering together, engaging in dialogue and reasoning through the myriad of problems that we face together. And, and you're never going to get 100% unanimity, but through that process, you can, you can you can come to some norms and standards and things that we think about otherwise as law. And at the end of the day, I think as a not for me as a non-indigenous person living in Canada is here in un unceded Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish territory, I have learned so much more about the place where I live mm -hmm. from learning about Tsleil-Waututh laws uh, on the area on uh, of the land where where I now reside. And for me, the way that we get out of this climate crisis that we're in is to incorporate better decision making. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, a shift which is uh, at the same time uh, very subtle but also arguably radical from our current our current decision making and our current legal structure which for companies who are often corporations who are often the parties who are um, you know, advancing industrial projects like a pipeline or a mine, uh, that their number one legal obligation is not maximizing profit, for example, which is the current state in Canadian law, and that there are other ways to think about and balance profit uh, and impacts to the environment. And I think it's that balance and refinding that balance that's that's going to get us uh uh, out of this uh, this challenge. We'll be right back. This interview series is part of the Green Collar Careers Program, brought to you by Relay Education. Relay is a Canadian charity that delivers renewable energy, environmental education, and green careers programs for youth. Remember to check out our website, relayeducation.com, and social media channels at Relay Education to find out when our next interview will be posted and to find resources on how to start your green career. So we've talked about what is needed is to becoming an environmental lawyer is unlearning and this learning process. 
more specifically, what, what skills in education would someone need to build up to become an environmental lawyer? Well, the good thing about law and practicing law is that you can have any background almost in or, and, and study law. Uh, my, me personally, I studied political science um, at, uh, at UBC uh, before I studied law at Dalhousie. But when I was at Dalhousie, I had uh, classmates who were um, music, uh, uh, had a music degree. I had a classmate who was literally a rocket scientist at NASA before what? moving to law school. Uh, I had friends who had studied uh, economics, who had studied philosophy. Uh, and so really, um, you know, there's, that's, a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing about it is that you don't necessarily need one specific type of education or background in order to engage in law. And that's because law is everywhere. It impacts yeah. us in many, many ways. And so uh, in that sense, I think, uh, you know, it's really, uh, that's just something I really wanted to, to emphasize is that it doesn't require a specific educational background. However, I do think that there are certain things that uh, certainly lawyers uh, and, and, and law students uh, tend to, to, to excel at. One is uh, critical thinking, you know, the ability to, you know, at the end of the day, our kind of our role is not just to say to memorize all the laws and apply them. There's a huge part of the role of a lawyer to apply and maybe change or alter what the law says uh, in relation to, uh, you know, the position of your clients or the position that you're advocating for. And so uh, part of it is just kind of understanding the mechanics of how decisions and stories become formalized and institutionalized in laws. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of reading uh, required. Uh, so if you're a speed reader, that is probably a helpful thing. Um, and, again, you know, again, nothing, something not, not, something that's universal, but in general, I found that lawyers uh, can be very effective communicators because it, you know, no matter how smart or complex, uh, you know, these issues are that you're talking about, if you can't communicate them in a, in a clear and compelling way, it's, it's kind of, it's often hard to advocate or get that point across. So yeah, that's, that's a good thing that there's no specific background that really you can study anything and, and if you decide later on that you want to go into law school, you can try for it. So what was your personal journey to getting into environmental law specific, specifically? When it came time to uh, decide what to do after my undergraduate degree, and just to be clear, I had no idea really what I wanted to do. I was very uh, confused. Um, I, I was working at uh, Ski Hills cooking having a great time actually. And um, it was only in those situations where I, in that circumstance where I was like, huh, okay, I wonder what else I could do. And law became one of the options that I, that I considered. Um, uh, I won't go into detail into the stories of it, but at the end of the day, really my, the main point is there isn't a single singular path you can follow. I was studying some environmental law courses, but for my own personal interests um, and looking at the pace and, and scale of change that happens, especially through litigation, uh, it's very slow and it's very incremental. So little small steps at a time. And mm -hmm. when, I, when I, my assessment of the climate crisis and the, and the scale of change that was needed, um, kind of led me away, to be honest, from the types of thing cases that I was studying um, in in my environmental law classes, and there were there was a couple things that kind of shifted that for me. The first was uh, the opportunity that I had through school to work uh, at a legal aid clinic, mm -hmm. and also here in the downtown east side in Vancouver as a legal uh, advocate. 
And these were not environmental issues at all um, at the time that we would we talked about them as poverty law issues, um, essentially working uh, and representing uh, people who are experiencing poverty and helping them navigate various administrative systems. So, for example, income assistance or housing uh, and things like that. And it was through the process of meeting with, engaging with, and, and being able to find solutions for people who are really struggling, some of the most marginalized people in our society, uh, that I decided that, okay, maybe I would give this a shot and actually try to practice law. And so when I started, it wasn't necessarily with a an environmental lens, but I always brought with me that human rights centered uh, approach. And mm -hmm. so that's why when I moved to West Coast Environmental Law with for the opportunity to work with Indigenous communities uh, on major infrastructure projects like the Trans Mountain uh, expansion, um, and just to be clear on opposing those, um, um, it just seemed like a, a really perfect fit. So that's what I'd said earlier about luck and timing. You know, it wasn't necessarily a, a pathway that I'd mapped out uh, and was following, but rather uh, uh, following my own passions, following my own interests, but being open to learning uh, as those opportunities came along. Yeah, I think that's really key, your openness in all of this. And you, your winding road still still led you to this incredible work that you are doing now. Can you tell me more about the work that you are doing surrounding the Trans Mountain expansion? And why do you believe this work is important? If you can believe it, I've been working uh, to oppose Trans Mountain Pipeline for uh, eight years now. My own motivation and, and, and why I think it's important, it can be boiled down to two things. We a, we cannot expand the oil and gas sector, especially some of the most, uh, you know, pollutant and expensive oil, uh, which is in the Alberta oil sands. We cannot be expanding those uh, during a climate crisis. And so the first step when you realize you're in a hole is to stop digging and, 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 and at the time there were three or four, actually four or five, uh, oil sands pipelines that were proposed and one by one uh, those have all been cancelled until now Trans Mountain is the only one left. The second reason is just as important and just as connected for me uh, which is the uh, violation of Indigenous rights and the the what Trans Mountain represents is forcing through a piece of energy infrastructure without the free prior informed consent of Indigenous people. And so my work has focused um, on that area and, and has involved a number of different elements that's included first and foremost working with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation to uh, express and apply their own laws uh, to the Trans Mountain Pipeline. People might remember the 2018 Slaywood versus Canada case, which was at the Federal Court of Appeal and which resulted in the quashing or overturning of the initial uh, approval of the pipeline. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the political and economic side of it. And part of my role has been to um, observe and analyze energy markets as they've changed. And what we've seen in the last eight years is a huge shift. And so, you know, not long after a Trans Mountain was proposed, uh, the price of oil sunk from something around a, over $100 a barrel to down to the 20s and 30s at one point. And at that, at, at, you know, at those prices, Trans Mountain really uh, was hard to justify economically. My political science degree has been really useful as well because at the end of the day, right now, Trans Mountain Pipeline is more political and more of a symbol, political symbol than anything, uh, than, than anything legal or economic in terms of the justification. Once you are an environmental lawyer, and as we talked about this case with the Trans Mountain Pipeline, how do you get a case and then what are the major steps towards taking it to court? We have uh, uh, clients who we represent 
and legal ethics that are related to representing those clients. With law, as we mentioned, it's it's everywhere. It impacts almost every uh, part of our lives. But at the same time, it's really important to also recognize that legal solutions or legal tools will not always or or not uniquely be able to solve every problem. Mm-hmm. And so um, for me, uh, part of it is, uh, is, is the working closely with clients to present options, to present uh, various scenarios, and, and then following the direction uh, based on that. Um, and uh, I'm lucky in the sense that I work um, uh, with an organization uh, that's aligned with my values and that uh, allows me to uh, work on things that I care about. That's not necessarily the case for every lawyer, um, especially in the private in private practice where you are working. Uh, you know, you're representing a client, and and their uh, values or their interests might differ from your own Mm -hmm. and that's important as well that's an important part of of the practice of law um but at the end of the day uh, for me this has been my experience and and that's something i feel really lucky to have ended up in this situation so shifting gears a little bit what can young people who are interested in environmental law do in promoting legal action say for instance like opposing the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion? First and foremost is to be, to know and be in touch with your local uh, representatives, whether that's on the provincial or federal level, and let them know what you care about. And even though, even if you're not quite old enough to vote, um, it still matters that your voice is heard and represented. And it's of course those representatives that are part of the, the lawmaking process that results in legislation and so on. At the same time, um, that's probably not enough and that's, I'm guessing for many people, not gonna be that satisfying. And what I've seen and really been inspired by uh, in the last couple of years is uh, youth organizing and and bringing their message in a way that cannot just be dismissed or ignored and i'm thinking of course of the climate strikes Mm -hmm. that have uh you know exploded uh, over the last couple of years i was really really lucky and privileged to get to spend a little bit of time with greta when she was here in vancouver uh, when and when she expressed an interest to meet with indigenous youth from here and and was a, I was able to help to facilitate that I think law is a tool that is part of this broader uh, uh, spectrum of, of options but by no means is it the only or even the most important one um, you know and if you're if you care about these issues I think you it's important to uh, to continue to educate yourself about them, to read uh, and 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 follow the emerging analysis that's coming out, um, and to and to look at where the where the where the critical pressure points are. We're not going to get there if we just rely on a few politicians or a few lawyers to do things. We all are part of the solution, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time. Um, the solutions are systemic and not individual. So just recycling, for example, is not, is also not going to do it. We need to advocate for and see shifts in the way that we make decisions as a society and the way that we do business as a society. What advice do you have for future lawyers or students interested in pursuing environmental law? You know, for me, for example, when I was in law school, um, I was really t- trying to avoid uh, corporate law, for example, because I was like, I'm not going to be a corporate lawyer. I'm not going to be one of those guys in suits or whatever. Um, and the reality is that in my current work, I actually do engage in corporate law quite a lot because we're trying to stop corporations from doing bad things and understanding how they work, understanding what the uh, mechanisms for intervention are, uh, all of those things are are useful and important. So I would say, again, being open 
uh, being open to to what you what you want and what you care about, but also finding organizations or people who are doing work that you care about and that you believe in and that you're passionate about that that share that match your values. Um, it's a never ending process uh, uh, education uh, yeah. that, that certainly doesn't stop with uh, formal education. And for me, I would argue that most of my biggest learnings have come outside of the institutional uh, setting. I think that's a really good note to, to end this all in. Is there anything else that you would like to leave our listeners with? There's one last thing I wanted to say, and that is um, a question I'm often asked about which is about hope where do i find hope and especially you know in the face of what seems to be an ever worsening climate crisis where um we're not frankly doing enough and not doing it quick enough uh, in spite of um, you know a shift in rhetoric and um, i'm inspired by something that i've read about this which around hope which is that hope is not something that you just find when you're just walking around doing work. Oh, look, there's hope. I'm going to pick it up put it in my <laughs> pocket and keep it with me. Hope is an action, is an action. Hope it is something that you have to be, that you have to live. Um, and it is even more powerful to do that when, when things seem hopeless and by directing your time and your energy, your work, uh, your education, uh, towards solving the problems that you see and you understand. That's how you create and that's how you be hope. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. How can our listeners connect with you and find out more about the work that you do? You can follow West Coast Environmental Law on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We are at W-C-E-L-A-W. W C E L A W, um, and uh, you can sign up. We have a newsletter which kind of gives a, a, a monthly uh, update on what we've been up to. We've got a blog on our website wcel.org, and um, yeah, we're always happy to hear from supporters and and um, and be part of this bigger conversation. Well, thank you so much, Eugene. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Anna. Really nice to have to talk to you. Thanks for sitting down with us in the green chair today. Once again, I'm your host, Anna Garza, and stay tuned for our next episode to learn more about the different paths people take to working in the green economy.